Barry. I'm the police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. This is the story that shocked the world. This is something that we've never seen before, and it really is the sort of thing that nightmares are made of. A dramatic escape after 11 years in captivity. And they see this girl, and she just going nuts on the door. So I'm like, what's your problem? Just open the door. And she says, I can't, you got it locked. The fear, the panic, her body would have been pumping with adrenaline. We found them. We found them. How had a school bus driver managed to kidnap and enslave three local girls? It's just chilling because she must have trusted him. How had they remained undiscovered under the noses of friends and neighbors? He, he fooled me for all these years. We don't know our neighbors. He was the best actor I ever, I ever met or seen in my life. A monster behind closed doors. They suffered years of abuse held as prisoners. This is just creepy. This is just absurd. This is sickening. This is their story. On the 6th of May, 2013, three women were rescued from a house in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Prayers have finally been answered. The nightmare is over. These three young ladies have provided us with the ultimate definition of survival and perseverance. Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight had been missing for 11 years. What had happened to them had been a mystery, and the police investigation had been far and wide. You're sending investigators to different countries looking for your daughter, thinking that they've been trafficked. And all along, your friend has your children. Incredibly, the three women have been held prisoner for 11 years in the same neighborhood where they disappeared. It's alleged that 52-year-old Ariel Castro kidnapped and imprisoned the three women, keeping them locked in his house for a decade. They had been held at 2207 Seymour Avenue. It's a street like any other in Cleveland's working class west side. It's always been a close community, all the, always, um, especially with the Hispanic uh, community. We all knew each other by face. And one face they all knew was that of Ariel Castro. He's said to have kept the women prisoner and abused them physically, mentally, and sexually. He had fathered a child with Amanda Berry during their time in captivity, and all the women had lived in fear, unable to escape from their suburban prison. But on the 6th of May this year, Amanda Berry saw a chance of freedom. She discovered that the door was unlocked. She hesitated to leave. Over the years, um, they're alleging that Ariel Castro used to leave doors open, according to my sources and the girls would peek their head out. He wasn't there, they'd go a little bit farther. And then he would show up and beat them to condition them that I control this house, you're not going anywhere. The thing that was different in this situation was the six-year-old daughter said to her, mommy, daddy said he was going to grandma's. And when Amanda heard that, she then knew there's a very, very high chance that he's not here, I've got to go for it. I've got to try. So Amanda Berry overcame her fears and took a chance that this time it wasn't a test and Castro had in fact left the door mistakenly unlocked. She took a deep breath, went out of her room that was unlocked, ran downstairs, saw that he wasn't there, started banging on the door. She must have been filled with fear and panic when she realized she was at the front door and that she might be able to get out even though the front door was locked. She, she started yelling. Some neighbors across the street heard her yelling. One of the neighbors that heard Amanda's cries for help was Angela Garcia, who lives opposite Castro's house on Seymour Avenue. We heard somebody knocking on the door right there and yelling, help me, help me, help me. It was another friend named Angel and the other neighbor from across the street. Um, they crossed the street and they went over there. 
She said, I'm Amanda Berry, help me. One of the neighbors said to have helped Amanda was Charles Ramsey. And I look and I see this girl and she just going nuts on the door. So I'm like, what's your problem? If you stuck, just open the door. The fear, the panic would have been driving her forward. She would have been pumping. Her body would have been pumping with adrenaline. And she says, I can't, you got it locked. And I look how he has it. And it's only enough to reach a hand out to grab the mail and, you know, close the door. And she, we, you know, naturally gonna pry it open. That didn't work. So we had to kick open the bottom. Luckily on that door it was aluminum, it was cheap. And she climbed out with her daughter. She went to my house. We called 911. Amanda Berry is trying to tell the dispatcher, this is Amanda Berry. I'm the one that's been missing for 10 years. I am free. You need 911. Call me, I'm Amanda Berry. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. OK, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. You can hear some of that in the 911 call, the fear, the panic the need for something to happen immediately. Talk to the police when they get there. OK, I'm going to leave right now. I need We're going to stop them as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get back. She wants the police there now because she thinks it, that Castro is going to come back at any point and reclaim her as his. All right, we're sending him, OK? OK. Who's the guy you're uh, trying? Who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. Amanda had escaped, but Gina De Jesus and Michelle Knight were still inside Castro's house. Two other young women are still in the house. She is afraid for her life, but she knows that the police have to come right at that moment if they're going to keep Ariel from coming to find her or go back in the house and kill her friends who are in there. The panic is palpable. And, uh, Steven, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. OK, I got, I got that What's here. I already know. <laughs> and uh, you said, what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And did you wipe by her saying I'm Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know, because he's not here right now. That's when, he he left, away. when he left, yeah. what was he wearing? Two yards of pity. Two and a half minutes after Amanda Berry made the 911 call, Officer Espada and Officer Tracy arrived at the scene. We pull up and we see this girl. She's like raising her hand, um, holding a child. I'm looking at my partner. You know, is it her? Look, I look up at her, apparently looks up at her, and we look at each other, and it's like, I, go to her, I think that's Amanda Berry. I think that's Amanda Berry. And she tells them, there's two more women in that house. Well, who's in the house? Well, another woman and Gina De Jesus. It was like another bombshell, just, just with overwhelming force just hitting me. Um, I, I, I believe I broadcasted that Gina might still be in the house. There might be others in the house. <laughs> Georgina De Jesus might be in this house also. So that clicks them into action. They get out of the car, they run over, go up the steps. Officer Spotted did it is, he went right upstairs. When he got that first foot on the hallway upstairs, out pops a woman. And he looks at her. And it's Michelle. She kind of popped out into the doorway and paused there for a second. Within moments, she came charging at me. She jumped on to me. She's like, you saved us, you saved us. It must have been a, a series of overwhelming emotions of disbelief, perhaps, that she'd finally managed to uh, escape from her abduction. And then within a few seconds, I see another girl come out of the bedroom. And I asked her, what, what's your name? She said, my name is Georgina De Jesus. That's when I broadcasted. Two out of 23, we found them. Out of 23 radio. Squad. We found them. We found them. And then suddenly, it's over. Can you imagine the position that you're going to be in? Can you imagine how you're feeling at that point? It's quite an extraordinary set of circumstances. Oh my God, it was crazy, crazy. The street, uh, well, they closed the whole street. It was like 15 cars of police. 
police cars, ambulance. It was a lot of people. The police quickly turned their attention to finding Ariel Castro, the person the women accused of holding them captive in the house for 10 years. My understanding is that Amanda Berry or others gave the police a description of his car and they went looking for him and they found him. And of course they arrested him and then they arrested his two brothers. His brothers were later released. In the days that followed, the police searched the Castro house and the extent of the horror of the girl's ordeal began to emerge. <laughs> It's the story that has shocked the world. For over a decade, three young women from Cleveland, Ohio, had been held in captivity. All these years, they were right under our nose. Until their dramatic escape. A miracle in itself, that they were still alive. As the three were reunited with loved ones, there were many questions about their ordeal that needed answering, beginning with how and why they had been abducted. The most consistent thing we see with sexual predators is that they look for vulnerable people. The abductions themselves seem to have been what I would call seducing abductions. In other words, these girls weren't snatched off the streets and bundled into the back of a car. He was using charm to seduce them into his car. I think he spent quite a bit of time planning on who he would target. And I think he spent quite a bit of time driving around, waiting for the right moment, them leaving a job or walking down the street. It wouldn't be something he could just randomly do. The first girl to disappear was 21-year-old Michelle Knight. She was last seen on August the 23rd, 2002, at a cousin's house near West 106th Street and Lorraine Avenue. Michelle had had a troubled life. Only a year before her abduction, she had been raped at school and given birth to a boy who was then placed in foster care. The first victim, Michelle Knight, was older, but her own family says that she has a mental disability that makes her confused about her surroundings. Perhaps her vulnerability was simply that she was too trusting. We know that she was also in crisis, having been extremely upset about recently losing custody of her child. There was some media reports about her disappearance. Her mom, I believe, said that she was missing. I think a lot of the media and the police and the community thought maybe this girl, 2021, just left town. Eight months later, in April 2003, Amanda Berry disappeared just a day before her 17th birthday. She just got out of Burger King, and he saw her walking and, and approached her in his car and said, hey, you know, you need a ride? You know, my son works at Burger King where you work at. And that put her guard down, made her feel comfortable. She texted her family, don't worry, I have a ride. And yet, she never got home. Whereas the disappearance of Michelle Knight had caused little fuss, the circumstances around Amanda Berry's case drew a lot more attention. It is highly unusual for a young teenager to not go home knowing the next day is her birthday, there's a birthday party, there's birthday presents, and for a young girl to leave cash in her bedroom. Just, just too many things were out of the ordinary. That feeling of unease was to grow. In 2004, 14-year-old Gina De Jesus, a friend of Ariel Castro's daughter, vanished as she walked home from Wilbur Wright Middle School. It was immediately linked to the story of Amanda Berry. Nearly a year later, almost to the date, that we have 14-year-old Gina De Jesus, almost in the exact same spot. Imagine Castro's daughter is friends with Gina, and he utilized that friendship to approach Gina when she was walking, and she felt very comfortable because obviously here's the father of one of her best friends. The dad of her friend apparently asks her for a ride. It's just chilling because she must have trusted him. While the disappearance of Michelle hadn't caused alarm for locals, the disappearance of Amanda and then Gina only a year later sent shockwaves through the community. It was a fear. It, it was hard for us. 
two teenage girls last seen from almost the same exact spot. And that started to send chills and, and shivers throughout the city of Cleveland. All the community was afraid to let their daughters walk to school. We didn't know what was going on. Where did they go? How did they just disappear? They just vanished. And yet, unknown to the girls' friends and family, they hadn't simply vanished. Getting inside Ariel Castro's car was to be the start of a terrifying ordeal for each of the three girls. When somebody is initially abducted, they are totally and utterly bewildered, frightened, appalled. They simply are trying to survive. Once they are inside of his house and realize that they are captives, that they cannot get out, complete panic sets in. The kind of screaming, running, pounding, um, begging, adrenaline rush, I will do anything to survive. So if you could put yourself in those young women's positions when they are first abducted and they are physically restrained in the basement of a house, the terror they must be experiencing at that point seems to me to have been extraordinarily high. It appears the only person who witnessed this terror was Ariel Castro. And yet to many of his friends and neighbors, there was never any sign that he was capable of such actions. I, I went to school with, with uh, Ariel Castro. Uh, he was never a problem in, in school. He played in a band with my family members and was always respectful and nice. I first met Ariel Castro back junior high school days where they was in this band called Los Tainos. And I was like really impressed with them, so I joined the band and it was a pretty good band. He was a great musician. Born in Puerto Rico, Castro had moved to Ohio as a young child. From an early age, his love of music became a key part of his identity. He was so famous, Every, everybody knew him because he used to play music for groups. So I used to sit down in the back, I used to get my little pop, sit down, my little sandwich, and I used to listen to it. And I hear him singing, and him with the bass player, I was like, wow, amazing. Castro bought his modest two-story home on Seymour Avenue in 1992. Working as a school bus driver in Cleveland over the next 20 years, he became a familiar and often popular face in the community. He blended in very well. He talked to the neighbors, he played with the kids. He would flirt with the girls in a way like wink at them. Or the girls, you know, it's just, they have a crush on their bus drivers. That he was a beautiful man. Ariel, you had a, a flat tire. He would stop what he's doing and come and help you. The fact that he would eat ribs with the neighbors, that everyone knew who he was and everyone described him as just the guy next door, very normal is part of the, the fascination with this case. The neighbors cannot believe that they were bamboozled. Knowing him, he acted so cool, cool, calm, casual. You couldn't see it. It's the banality of evil. People who do evil things, despicable things, look like you and me. Nothing suspicious, nothing, no noise, no nothing. But unknown to many of his friends, behind closed doors, Ariel Castro had a dark side. Castro had several run-ins with the law over alleged domestic violence towards his ex-partner, Grimelda Figueroa, with whom he had three daughters and a son between 1981 and 1990. Eventually, after numerous complaints, Grimelda left Castro and won custody of their children. Very often, conflict with the wife can be a trigger for them going out and actually going on the prowl for their next victim. Was it this breakup of his family that caused Ariel Castro to snap? Or was there something deeper within his personality? Nobody wakes up one morning and decides that he's going to abduct three women. This kind of offender is a long time in the making. Remember, he's a sexually motivated captor. And so while control is his primary motive, the secondary motive is absolutely sex and sexual gratification. He's fantasized about this. He's rehearsed this. He's practiced this before he eventually does this. The predators call it having sex on a shelf, having access to something like a can of soup on a shelf that you can 
take off anytime you want. So that anytime you have a sexual urge, it's so simple. Just go to the bedroom or go to the basement and there is, there's your sexual captive to do, to use, to abuse, to exploit any way that your fantasies desire. Further insight into Castro's mind can be found from one of the key items police recovered from his home on Seymour Avenue. Someone with the FBI found a letter, a letter that investigators believe was written in 2004 and written by the prime suspect, Ariel Castro. Extracts reveal Castro's attitude towards the women he abducted. They are here against their will because they made a mistake of getting in a car with a total stranger. Castro is trying to blame other people, in this case, the girls, for getting into a car with a so-called total stranger. He's downplaying his total responsibility for these acts and trying to say it was their fault for trusting me. In another section of the letter, Castro even threatened to commit suicide, revealing the turmoil he felt about the conflicting sides of his personality. He talks about how public life, he's normal publicly, but he's different privately. So you got a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde here. These two sides of his personality were apparent in his dealings with the families of Amanda Berry and Gina de Jesus after the girls went missing. Incredibly, Castro even played a role in the vigils held in their memory. It's almost hard to believe when I say it that, that he had the audacity to show up at the vigils, the candlelight vigils for Gina when he knew where she was. Here's a man that was right there holding a candle, playing in a band, having a fundraiser, shaking their hands, giving them hugs, wishing them well, you know? And they weren't casual. This is friends and family and close associates. He led the prayer. Um, of the vigils. He, he was the first one there to lead them, hold everybody, hold hands. I, it's just, it, it's just weird. Who does that? You had the girls all this time and you're standing right there with us. Like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a monster behind closed doors. But what happened in that house? Why hadn't the women tried to escape? And how had Castro managed to hide them away? so long. Amanda Berry, Gina de Jesus, and Michelle Knight had been allegedly kidnapped and locked in a house for 10 years by Ariel Castro. At times like this, it's a story that, that has gripped the world as people try to comprehend won. what these women must have gone through. I think a lot of the public's fascination with this case is that what has happened to these young women, what they are telling us, is something that is beyond the pale of our imaginations. It's extremely rare that you have somebody kept for more than 10 years. The mental scars left after years of captivity and abuse will be profound. For ordinary people, it's hard to imagine what they must have been through, locked away by their abuser. These three women have been cut off from what makes them human, from what makes their identity real. They're cut off from family, from friends, from growing up in schools, going to work, having their first boyfriend. They've been cut off from every normal maturation process. Why hadn't these women tried to escape? How had Castro managed to condition them to remain quiet and hidden away from the rest of the neighborhood for so long? In the initial stages of a kidnapping, the first thing that happens is you literally put the fear of God in them. If you even deviate, I will kill you. If you will listen to me, things will go well for you. Now the mind goes into survival. The only way I will survive this is to contain my panic and try to figure out how to get out of here. I need to be nice to him. I need to give him what he wants. If I cooperate and if I do what he wants and I become somewhat of a relationship to him, not just sexually, but 
personally, and a lot of people call it the Stockholm Syndrome and other names, the victim starts to develop some sort of relationship with the kidnapper. They have to do this because otherwise they will live in a perpetual state of panic. The girls develop a coping mechanism called dissociation. They learn to be in a situation, for example, when they're being sexually assaulted or raped, and they learn to kind of pretend that they're a spectator watching the situation, that they're an observer and they're not actually involved in what's going on. And that's a coping skill. It's reported that when Castro thought he had control of the women, he moved them out of the basement and into different parts of the house. He no longer has to physically control them and intimidate them because he's already socialized them into accepting his absolute and total control over them psychologically. He moved them up into separate rooms with little slots in the room so he could put in food and put in water. He also punished these girls, and the way he punished them was if they disobeyed, if they acted out, he wouldn't feed them, so you don't get any food. Amazingly, Castro felt he had such control over the women he had guests at the home. One of these was Ricky Sanchez, who was in a band with Castro and went to his house every week to play music. I used to go there and I used to cook there. You know, being a Latino person, being from Puerto Rico, we like rice and beans, okay? I used to cook rice and beans. I used to go there and I used to cook there. You know, being a Latino person, being from Puerto Rico. He'd lock them upstairs, he'd have music playing, and he threatened them. You make a sound when I have people here, I will kill you when they leave. I mean, these women were intimidated and controlled mind, body, and soul. However, once, when Ricky went there for band practice, he did hear some strange noises, but Castro had a ready-made excuse. And I noticed there's some, like, a uh, boom, boom, in the walls, right in the walls. When he came back, I asked him, Ariel, what is these noises are? And then I started laughing, you know, because I took it, I said, yo, I, I, I had no idea what was going on. So, well, I have some dogs in, in the second level, you know, in the upstairs. But again, he came, he took the radio, he cranked it all the way up. Any conversation you have, he was, it was hard to, for you to hear him unless you be screaming, talking loud, because the music, it was always loud. He was the best actor I ever met or seen in my life. Castro's next door neighbor, Storm, noticed that his behavior was strange over the years. In late April last year, it was, the weather was sort of warm. Me and my family had a cookout. So I just made myself a little fire pit, you know. No bother, no nothing. And I'm just sitting there. My dog comes out behind me. He looks up and he starts growling. Then I look up, it's Ariel. I, he looked down at me and I said, can I help you? He goes, you can't have that fire there like that, man. The creepiness. I don't know how long he was up there watching me. I don't know, you confronting um, your neighbor behind you by, you know, watching them from a roof at night on your garage, I don't think, you know, I'm gonna be friends with you. The letter that was reportedly found at Ariel Castro's house can give further insight into his mind. In that letter, he says things like, I'm a sexual predator. He says, I'm sick. I've got something going on in my head and I don't know. I need help. He's got an insight that he's a sexual predator, but he still goes on to sexually predate. And also what that phrase does is it takes responsibility away from him. I need help. So he's actually saying, if you don't give me the help, then of course I'm going to behave as I'm behaving. He also said that if he died, he was gonna leave his money, his property, everything he owned to those three ladies. As if he can simply wipe away the 10 years of physical, sexual, and psychological torture by giving them a few thousand dollars. I mean, this is absurd. 
year after year, it seems the women's relationships grew, and it appears their shared experience in this nightmare strengthened the bond between them. These girls, Gina, Amanda, and Michelle, were really a family over those years. They came together very, very close because my sources tell me when he punished Michelle, Gina and Amanda would sneak her food to keep her alive. When Amanda was punished, Michelle and Gina would sneak her food. We do know they watch TV because Amanda would talk about how she saw the newscast talking about her disappearance. Michelle is a totally different story. She didn't get a lot of press coverage. And I understand that in the house, that bothered her. You'd always hear, Amanda Berry's missing. Gina DeJesus is missing. But you wouldn't hear that Michelle Knight was missing. And that was an emotional struggle for her inside that house. I think Michelle became the unwanted one. I think he developed a very negative uh, attitude towards her and I think she became an abuse object and I think Amanda became you know more of a pleasurable relationship for him. The different attitude Ariel reportedly had towards Amanda and Michelle is demonstrated by the fact that he impregnated both women whilst in captivity but allowed Amanda to keep the baby whereas he forced Michelle to miscarry. When Amanda Berry gave birth to her daughter, that he actually insisted that Michelle Knight not just deliver the baby, but give it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to make sure that it survived, and yet it completely flies in the face. To the opposite side, the different dark face of Ariel Castro, based on Michelle Knight's allegations that he impregnated her at least five times and then starved her for up to two weeks and beat her in the stomach and abdomen to force her to miscarry those pregnancies. In 2006, Amanda gave birth in the house to a baby girl with Michelle apparently being forced to deliver her in a small paddling pool with no medical assistance. Most births are quite messy, quite bloody, quite dramatic. And imagine if you had nothing, no towels, no sheets, nothing to help you. Three lives were at stake when Amanda gave birth to that baby. Apparently, one of the girls delivered the baby without any medical experience or training, and also basically with, with a figurative shotgun to her head. She was told, if this baby doesn't come out alive and you don't deliver this baby, a healthy baby, then you will get killed. She was born there in that house. She was born in a little plastic swimming pool. So this is the only life she knew. She didn't know any other life. Amanda's daughter, Jocelyn, grew up in the house with her mother imprisoned along with the two other women. But Castro gave Jocelyn more freedom and his next door neighbor, Storm, saw her playing in the garden. I just seen a little girl, fun, with daddy. Um, she was, what, five years old at the time, I believe? And there are several incidents that he did try to skull her, you know, be real stern with her, like a fatherly way, but not abusive. Not abusive. He loved her. You could tell he loved her, so. As the years went on, it's reported Castro taunted the girls by letting them watch TV reports of the search for them. Castro seems to have allowed the three women to follow news reports about the fact that they were missing and that their families were looking for them. But here's the irony, because I think what that did was allowed these women, and crucially Amanda Berry, to realize that she hadn't been forgotten, that there were still people looking for her. Amanda never gave up hope, and on May the 6th, she finally saw her chance to escape. On this particular day, she had had enough, and she was overwhelmed with a sense that if it's not today, it will never happen. But another factor became stronger in this case than his intimidation and fear, and that factor was what he might do to her daughter as the daughter got older, and secondly, the mom instinct told her what kind of life does my daughter have in the future here if we stay? And I believe that combination is what caused this freedom 
to happen. The women had been prisoners in the house for 11 years and their ordeal was finally over. They were free. But what will be the impact of this traumatic experience upon them as they try to adapt to life in the outside world? And what will be the reaction when Castro finally goes to court and amazingly pleads not guilty? Three young women had escaped from a suburban house in Cleveland, Ohio after being missing for 11 years. They had been beaten and raped, and one of them had even borne a child by her captor. But the Ohio slave girl's horrific experience is more common than we think. We remember Elizabeth Smart, and in Austria, Natasha Kampusch, and the Fritzl daughter, Elizabeth Fritzl. And shortly thereafter, the mind-blowing case of J.C. Dugard uh, recovered after 18 years. And so while we've been absorbing this, it was really unthinkable that there could be others out there. The three young women imprisoned in Cleveland, Ohio, were finally safe. There was a sense of relief that it was all over. You have a very jubilant city. Uh, not only a jubilant city, but it spreads to the state, to all the states, to the world, because this represents something very important, freedom. It had seemed like a Hollywood nightmare, a town unaware of the monster in its midst. The family is, is, can't imagine that there was a wolf in sheep's clothing, that he was so close you could touch him, and yet you had no idea that you were being deceived and betrayed by someone that you thought was your friend. I'm very angry. He's a monster. He had no right to do everything he did to the community for many, many years, but mostly to those families, and especially the girls. For the kidnappers' victims, the world in 2013 was a totally unfamiliar place. It will be almost like coming out of a coma. They've got to learn everything again. They've got to learn who their, what their identity actually is. They've got to learn to deal with people. They've got to learn to deal with space, with noise, with light, with freedom. The women were rushed to nearby Metro Health Medical Center. No one knew what their physical state would be. They were brought here to our emergency department. The women were assessed from head to toe looking for immediate or emergent, emergent problems. However, now that they are released to, to home, to their families, ongoing care is absolutely necessary. The number one variable in their ability to be resilient and to move forward and have as close to a normal life as they could has everything to do with a family support network. And close relationships beyond the family could be forever overshadowed by their confinement. These women are going to meet men, are going to want to establish relationships. How do you begin to set up a normal relationship when the relationship that you've had for 10 years has been pathological about satisfying the needs of somebody like Castro? <laughs> First thing I remember when I when I knew Amanda Berry was coming home, it was it was like a scene out of a movie, but it was real. And there's that van that you just know Amanda Berry is in with her child. And then you just see some of her cousins and a lot of neighbors and Walwishers just blowing her kisses. Blowing her kisses and it's toward that van. Jocelyn, Amanda's daughter, and then Amanda herself entered the house. One of the main drivers for the Cleveland escape had been to secure a better life for the six-year-old. Amanda just got this incredible faith in her that I finally can get out. And she heard that from Jocelyn, and she took that chance and saved everybody. But I think who really saved everybody was that little girl. Amanda has a six-year-old child to take care of. She has a much greater motive and impetus to be a normal person. She has to for her daughter's sake. 
But that will be different, of course, than Gina's experience. At 23 or 24, she will be a different person than Will Michelle Knight, who's in her early 30s, who unfortunately doesn't have as strong an extended family network, who when she last saw her mother, they had a tremendous fight and a lot of discord over the custody battle over her child. The reintegration process in these cases is about replacing the ties with the captor with those of the family. They have to break the bonds that they've psychologically had to establish with the person who's done this because they are at last free. And that's the problem that the abductee has once this, these kinds of dreadful incidents come to an end. On May the 8th, Gina de Jesus returns home. One of the few people who has met any of the women since their release is campaigner Matt Zone, who was invited to Gina's house two days after the release. As we were in the kitchen, I was looking into the living room, and this young woman, who I never saw before, got up and walked through the kitchen, and I pointed to the woman, and I said to the mom, who is that? And she goes, oh, that's Gina. And I just couldn't believe it. Um, she had this amazing, beautiful smile. Her mother said something in Spanish to her aunt, and she looked at her mom, and she's like, mommy. And she, Nancy said to me, she's not speaking Spanish anymore. I want to thank everybody that believed. Even when I said she was alive, and believed, and I want to thank them. Even the ones that doubted, I still want to thank them the most. Because they're the ones that made me stronger, the one that made me feel the most that my daughter was out there. Nancy and Felix are like the greatest. They never, ever, ever gave up hope on Gina, ever. They were right there the whole time. I don't know how that strength that those two, two parents have. I couldn't do it. I, honest to God, I wouldn't be able to do it if somebody took one of my children. Ariel Castro started kidnapping and rape on one side, kidnapping and rape on the second. At his court appearance, Castro was charged with three counts of rape and four charges of abduction. He's on an $8 million bail bond and is in solitary confinement faced with the death penalty. I'm told that he's in a small cell He's secluded from everyone else. He doesn't have access to TV, he doesn't have access to newspaper, radio, nothing at all. He's just in this small little nine by eight cell and he's depressed, he's subdued. Um, he's walking around the cell naked. I have no idea why he's doing that. And it's not over yet. Six days after his arrest, Castro turned a plea of not guilty. So a judge will have to decide what really happened in 2207 Seymour Avenue, and the girls may have to relive their ordeal in court. He, he fooled me for all these years. After, I thought he was a good friend of mine. And after all, I said, no. You know why? I have a daughter. She's 20 years old. That could have been happened to me. Wow. Well, Every abduction of a woman by a man who wants to use her as an object seems to me to be every woman's worst nightmare. But when you multiply by three and you think that it lasts for a decade, it's extraordinary. And this is an extraordinary case that we will be talking about for years to come. There's no normal life with them, children. It's gone. It's gone. Yet the Cleveland story inevitably suggests a further chilling prospect. We are very concerned about how many missing children, and we know that there are tens of thousands of them, might be alive, that we've given up for dead, that are simply being held in captivity, not just with physical bonds, but with psychological imprisonment, with the belief over years of brainwashing that no one cares about them and they will never be found. We presumed that Gina de Jesus, Michelle Knight, and Amanda Berry had died. In fact, they were simply locked up in a cellar 
unable to escape. How many other young women are in similar positions that we simply don't know about? All these years, they were right under our nose, and nobody ever knew. Nobody ever knew. Stay with us for the first in a two-part crossover event, CSI Vegas meets New York, next. <laughs>